Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Viafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. All right, well, let's jump right into cyanuric acid. So can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. We, we talked a little bit about, about what it does and why it does what it does and the good things about it. How do you test for cyanuric acid? Well, this is one of those tests that I actually can't stand because it, it's a turbidimetric test. And what that means is that you're looking at cloudiness. And everybody's going to interpret the answer a little bit different than everybody else. But basically what you're doing is you're taking a sample of water and adding a reagent to it that, that's, that contains something called melamine. And it's actually the same thing that's in drywall. Uh, the, 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 the powdery kind of stuff in drywall, it's the same thing, but in liquid form. And the melamine combines with the cyanuric acid to form a cloudiness that's proportional to the amount of cyanuric acid in a sample. And then you slowly squirt that mixed uh, sample into a tube that has a little black dot at the bottom. And when that black dot d- disappears, and that's critical, disappears, meaning you don't see it anymore, not I just about see it, but you don't see it anymore, you stop adding. And then you look at where the water level stops on, on the comparator block, and that's your cyanuric acid level. Now, with cyanuric acid, you don't need to be specific. I don't need to know I have you know, 42.25 four parts per million and so no you just need to know you need to fall between 30 and 50 and if it's over 50 you need to drain it down a little bit so that's under 50 but that's all you really need to know about it and that's the good thing about cyanuric acid and there and there's no interferences with the cyanuric acid test that's the good thing yay first one <laughs> i feel like cyanuric acid has been kind of here anyway we've been hearing about that a lot lately i mean mm-hmm. there's been talk about you know them pulling tabs in the future because cyanuric acid levels being so high and, you know, and there's always like, if you're adding, you know, stabilizer to pools, it's raising yeah. cyanuric acid levels and you don't really need to add it. Mm-hmm. And then people are like, you have to add it, you know? So there's mm-hmm. like this, you know, kind of confusion, just like, you know, everything else. Of other things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we, well, we talked about earlier about, you know, how much cyanuric acid is in, is in two tablets, that kind of thing. Yeah. And you're constantly adding, adding it if you're using um, a stabilized form of chlorine. Uh, but if you're adding cyanuric acid separately, you're going to be doing it if, say, you're feeding a pool uh, with sodium hypochlorite instead of, uh, you know, an erosion feed or something like that. Or if it's a chlorine generator pool, salt pool, okay, you're going to want to add cyanuric acid separately. And you, it's a powder. It's a very fine powder. You pre-mix it. You pour it in. In this case, you pour it in the skimmer. Uh, that's the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. And then that circulates through very quickly. And you were saying after that test was conducted that they said after 40 or 50 parts per million, it's 50. not after 50 uh-huh. parts per million, it's no longer. No benefit. No, no, benefit. no, no uh, extra keeping the chlorine in the water. Uh, it just flat lines out as far as effectiveness. And it's not worth the money, the time and, and the hassle. How does yeah. a pool have such high cyanuric acid levels, like sky mm-hmm. high and mm-hmm. can still have really high chlorine readings? Uh, because they, they, they've been feeding uh, tablets into a floater or an erosion feeder forever, number one. And they're putting in chlorine separately probably or adding chlorine separately because the amount of chlorine that is produced from a tab is not really that much. Okay, um, it, it, it does contribute over the course of time, obviously. But to have a high level of chlorine, uh, you would have to add some kind of non-stabilized chlorine to the water first before you would start up a floater or an erosion feeder. It's at just really, really high level. This might be a stupid question. No, stupid we could take questions. it out, but <laughs> is there, say you switched over to using just liquid chlorine. Okay. Is there um, cyanuric acid in no. liquid chlorine? No, no. There's no, no cyanuric is that acid. Why they usually, is that why they're yes. switching over to using the liquid yeah. feeders? Yeah, because sodium hypochlorite, all the hypochlorite products, sodium, lithium, and calcium hypochlorite, do not contain cyanuric acid. They're called unstabilized chlorine. The only stabilized chlorines are the tablets, dichlor and trichlor. So is it safe to say maybe if your cyanuric acid levels are creeping up Mm -hmm. and if you wanted to maybe keep away from that happening, Mm -hmm. maybe just kind of stick to liquid chlorine? Stick to liquid for a while. Yeah, take the floater out. Yeah. Because right now we can't really drain pools. We right. can't even drain half the pools because it's still too warm. Right. So, you know, that could be a thing yeah. too. just switch, with switch over to liquid for, for whatever amount of time needed. And that could yeah. be good for the winter time because we still deal with yeah. 70, 80 degree weather out okay. here. And if, I mean, think about it, if that's three or four months that we could not 
we can just remove uh-huh. chlorine tablets from the pool and just stick with, you know, liquid chlorine. Because, yeah. I mean, it's we go from having to use, you know, four, three or four chlorine tabs to the to the winner, which is yeah. t- like a little piece yeah. or <laughs> half a chlorine tablet. Small you know, little chunk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it might not even be, you know, necessary, but yeah. um, adding the liquid could definitely yeah. have a huge benefit. To absolutely. It. Yes, absolutely. And then working along with that calcium harness, it, it with calcium harness, another portion of water balance, it's a drop test like total alkalinity. You get a sample of water, you add a series of reagents, and you go normally from red to a pretty sky blue color. Okay. Um, the, the only thing that's going to mess up a calcium harness test is metals, period. High chlorine, high bromine, no, this is where it kind of stops. But uh, the presence of copper and iron will cause the, the colors that normally go from uh, a red to a sky blue color, it'll go red to a great Kool-Aid color kind of purple. Uh, and that's a clear sign you have copper or iron in the water. Um, and therefore, you need to test for copper or iron to find how much you have in there because high levels of copper and high levels of iron will obviously cause staining. Usually with copper, it's over 0.3 parts per million and with iron, it's 0.2. So low levels of iron can really cause a problem. But again, you don't see that terribly much in municipal systems. In wells, you do. So that's why it's important, like we were talking before, to, to test your incoming water to know where you are and what you need to deal with at all times. Um, how to correct for uh, metal presence in calcium harness. This one's a little tricky, but it can be done, and it's pretty easy if you follow the instructions in, 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 in the book. You get a new sample of water. Okay? You, take, you have three reagents that you needed to use for calcium harness test. In my case, it's number 10, which is a buffer, and that's going to change the pH of your sample so you get the right colors. The second reagent is the indicator itself, and the third reagent is what we call a titrant. That's what you're counting the drops of to go from one color to another. Well, the titrant that we use in our calcium harness test has something in it called EDTA, ethylene diamine triamino ethanol. In English, what that means is it's a metal sequestering product. So you're adding four or five drops of that first to hide all the metal ions that are in the sample so that when you add your buffer and your indicator, it's not going to be affected. And then you do the test normally. But you add the number of drops of number 12 that you added in the beginning to hide everything to your total drop count. So, for example, say we did the test and I added five drops of number 12 first. I did the test normally and it took me 25 drops to go from uh, red to blue. 25 plus the 5 in the beginning is 30. So it was really 30 drops is what your drop count is, time your drop, time to drop equivalents, and that's what your answer is. And that's it. The calcium harness is, is a pretty pretty stable test. It's really easy. Uh, correcting it is a little bit, you know, you have to think about it a, a tad. But uh, unless you're dealing with metals in the water, you usually don't have to worry about it. What is calcium harness exactly? How does that affect the pool? A calcium harness it contributes to a water balance in that um, all all of the the in, in an in ground gunite pool. Okay, you've got gunite, you've got concrete, you've got grout. Okay, guess what's all in there? Calcium. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you want that water balanced. Ha 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 ha! Here it comes back to this, so that the water will not try to balance itself despite your best attempts. And if it does try to balance itself, despite what you do, it's going to pull calcium out of the grout, out of the gunite, out of the concrete. And that's where you get pitting and etching and all those horrible little little things that you see. Like, wait a minute, I grouted that a little while ago. How come there's no grout there? And all you've got is a tile sitting there. The water's trying to be trying to seek out calcium at all times. So if you uh, have the correct amount of calcium hardness in the water, it's not going to do that. That's where water balance plays in, in, into it. Okay, so it's not going to be aggressive enough that it's going to try to pull out that grout. Now, the interesting thing is that, hey, guess what? We have other kinds of pools out there. We've got fiberglass pools. We have vinyl liner pools. We have acrylic shells for for uh, for spas. You know, how about calcium harness in there? There, there isn't any grout or or gunite or concrete. Or well, that that's why that's what makes it a little bit different. The ideal range for calcium harness for your standard in ground gunite pool or spa is 200 to 400 parts per million, okay? For any other kind of pool, vinyl, fiberglass, acrylic, it's 150 to 250 because there's no no way for the water to, to pull a calcium 
from there's no, there's nothing there. There is no calcium for it to pull. So you can keep a little bit lower levels in there. How do you adjust it? You add calcium chloride to increase it. Usually lots and lots of calcium chloride to increase it if you're low. Like in my case, out of our tap, it's 50 parts per million. You got to add a lot of calcium carbonate, okay, or calcium chloride. Uh, to lower it, the only way to lower calcium harness readings is to drain the water, really. I mean, you can run it through an RO system. It might bring it down a little bit. But, again, you're using an RO system, and you might be going through two or three of them to get it down low enough. But, but honestly, the, the only way to do it is drain and refill with water that has a lesser amount. If the calcium harness is too high, how, how, what does that do? Uh, cal high calcium harness readings, uh, cloudy water, scaling, that kind of thing. Uh, low calcium harness means that the water's trying to balance itself, so you've got pitting, etching, things like that, streaking. Yeah. So some visual indicators could be like calcium buildup, lines on the tile. And exactly, around like the tile that. line, around steps, things of that nature. Yeah. I've seen those you know, like calcium deposits mm -hmm. form on mm -hmm. the first surfaces. Is that that's it? Is that because yep. it's yep. too high? Mm -hmm. Too high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. will you see that higher on salt pools because you're having to clean no. the salt cell? No, not usually not. No, no. Uh, what you will see it is though on hotter water environments because calcium likes to come out of solution in hot water. So I mean the temperature of the water of the pool we were at this afternoon that was pretty warm. Okay, so if the calcium harness was was high and it wasn't, but if it was high. You, you would see calcium come out of solution. You might see a cloudy pool, a little bit of buildup here and there. Uh, for spas, obviously, it's a hot water situation, so you want to keep that at a lower calcium harness reading, too. And that's pretty difficult. And that's difficult. pretty common out here because yeah. all yeah. that's actually that pool's cooled down quite a bit. Wow. Mm. Yeah. All the pools out here in the summertime are usually around 90 degrees. Wow. With no heater, no nothing. That's my kind of temperature pool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's like a bath. It doesn't feel good when it's 115 outside. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Do it. It's definitely not enjoyable. Thank you guys so much for listening. We truly appreciate you giving us your time and your ear. We know how important and valuable that is. So thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, you can reach us at poolchasers.info at gmail.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our tag is Pool Chasers. If you guys could take a minute and go to Apple Podcasts to rate and review the podcast, we would truly appreciate it. See you out there, Pool Chasers. chasers.